Thanks again for joining me here at Preaching the Gospel That Saves and But Now Ministry. And like I said in my first part of Thanksgiving, we're going to take a little break from Difficult Saints and Who is the Uncircumcision. And we're going to talk about Thanksgiving. We're going to talk about John Hancock's proclamation back in 1791 about the day of Thanksgiving. Now, if you have not heard the message in part one, I would encourage you to go back because that is the proclamation read as John Hancock presented it. This part, as we continue to go forward, we're going to break that down and see if we can find the church, the body of Christ, and see if we can see the fellowship of the mystery, right? Ephesians 3, 9. And we're going to see if John Hancock preached Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16, 25. So the following text of a proclamation for a day of thanksgiving and praise issued by John Hancock, who is the signer of the Declaration of Independence while he was serving as governor of Massachusetts. In consideration of the many undeserved blessings conferred upon us by God, the Father of all mercies, it becomes us not only in our private and usual devotion to express our obligations to Him, as well as our dependence upon Him, but also specially to set apart a day to be employed for this great and important purpose. I have therefore thought fit to appoint, and by the advice and consent of the council, do hereby accordingly appoint Thursday, the 17th of November, next to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and praise throughout this commonwealth, hereby calling upon ministers and people of every denomination to assemble on the said day and in the name of the great mediator, devoutly and sincerely offer to Almighty God the gratitude of our hearts for all his goodness towards us. Note, mediator. The word is mentioned seven times in six verses. It has nothing to do with the Pope. Here's a recent article. Venezuela President Nicolas Maduro on Sunday welcomed an offer by Pope Francis for Vatican mediation in the crisis-torn country, but opposition leaders rebuffed the overture. The Pope's call for a negotiated solution came in response to waves of protest by Venezuelans demanding new elections to pull the country out of a downward spiral. At least 28 people have died in protests since they began in April, and hundreds have been arrested. Dramatic news on the worsening of the situation in Venezuela keeps coming in with numerous deaths, injuries, and prisoners, the pontiff said before a crowd of 70,000 attending weekly prayers in St. Peter's Square. United in sorrow with families of the victims, I issue a sincere appeal to the government and all sectors of Venezuela society to avoid all forms of violence henceforward, said the pontiff. Urging respect for human rights, Francis said the Vatican was willing to act as a mediator under clear conditions. Galatians 3.19, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Galatians 3.20, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews 8.6, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Now, you're going to see the definition of mediator here, according to the revelation of the mystery, and according to the New Testament for Israel. Okay, That's what you get in Hebrews. You get who the mediator is for Israel in the New Testament for Israel. And then in Galatians and 1 Timothy, you get who the mediator is for the church, the body of Christ. Okay, One mediator, two programs, two ministries. Hebrews 9.15, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions, 
that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And Hebrews 12, 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. The only goodness toward us that God gives today in the dispensation of God's grace is what Christ did on Calvary's cross. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. No physical blessings today, just spiritual. That's right. If you happen to live to be 100 years old, or if you happen to live to be 50 years old, it has nothing to do with God blessing you. Okay? There are ministries out there that claim, because they're old, that that was a blessing from God. No, it just so happened that you live to be old. Things happen by chance. Study the word chance in your Bible. There are over there are 37 verses that contain the word chance and peradventure. Things happen by chance. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And then John Hancock goes on, More specially, in that he has been pleased to continue to us so a great a measure of health. Does God give us good health today in the dispensation of the grace of God? What about infirmities? Webster's 1828 de definition of infirmity, an unsound or unhealthy state of the body, weakness, feebleness, old age is subject to infirmities. Oh, really? Weakness of mind, failing, fault, foible, a friend's short bear of friend's infirmities. Number three, weakness of resolution. Number four, any particular disease, malady, applied rather to chronic than to violent diseases. And number five, defect, imperfection, weakness as the infirmities of a constitution of government. First Timothy 5.23 Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thy often infirmities. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Romans 26, 826. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know now what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 15, 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. 2 Corinthians 11.30 If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. So are you glory? Do you glory when you have bad health? Because you should, because whether you have good, good health or bad health, you're seated in heavenly places. Whether you have good health or bad health, you are complete in Christ. Whether you have good health or bad health, he has given you all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Whether you have good health or bad health, He has forgiven you all trespasses. Do you understand what Christ has done when you trust the gospel of God's grace, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and when you understand that He's given you all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, not physical blessings in the kingdom to come? 2 Corinthians 12, 5, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Glorying in your infirmities is contrary to the prayers that you find at these denominational, non-denominational places where they're asking God for healing. It is because they don't understand what God is doing today in the dispensation of God's grace. They have been taught that they're Israel, all the promises are for Israel, and they're under a law and covenant. And that is why 
those people that believe that, that is why they will end up in hell and be very surprised. If God was healing today, why do we need hospitals? How many hospitals are in the U.S.? I mean, I have a friend who pulled his tendon off the top, right below his buttocks. He was going to water ski, and he was holding, you know, the rope, and, to, and he was getting ready to be pulled up out of the water. And when he got pulled up, his skis got caught, and it pulled the hamstring right out of the top of his buttock, right, right below his rear end, okay? And he could not even walk. And this was a person that I used to go to harvest with. And I asked him, I said, why doesn't he just go to Benny Hinn instead of the doctor and have Benny Hinn heal him? And he just rolled his eyes. So he understands that God's not healing, but yet he will ask and pray for healing. Isn't that funny? How many hospitals are in the U.S.? Total number of all U.S. registered hospitals, 5,534. Number of federal government hospitals, 209. Number of non-federal psychiatric hospitals, 397. Other hospitals, 88. Total staff beds in all U.S. registered, 894,574. So why doesn't Benny Hinn go to these places and heal these people? Or anybody else who claims they're healing. Any pastor out there who claims they're healing, meet me at Children's Memorial tomorrow. How many doctors are in the U.S.? Because didn't Jesus say, if you're sick, go see a physician? But I thought he was healing people in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then why would Jesus say that? You better understand what Jesus was doing when it came to healing because he told the sick to go find a doctor. How many doctors? Statistics and facts on U.S. physicians and doctors. In 2013, there were over 1 million doctors of medicine, over 1 million of doctors in medicine all over the United States. This figure included some 148,000 inactive and some 44,000 unclassified physicians. How about pharmacies? I had a friend who was a vice president for Walgreens. And this was probably 10 years ago. And every 26 minutes, a Walgreens was built. 67,000 pharmacies. There are approximately 67,000 pharmacies in the United States. Almost half, 33,000, are located within drugstores, grocery stores, hospitals, department stores, medical clinics, surgery clinics, universities, nursing homes, prisons, and other facilities. Hopefully, you're not believing your pastor's nonsense about being anointed with oil for healing. I believed it and actually performed it on my daughter. And I won't get into that, but my daughter needed to be healed and when I was under harvest translate translation chapels teaching I took first I took James chapter 5 out of its context because if you read James chapter 1 verse 1 James is talking to the 12 tribes of Israel well if I understood my Bible as it stood and understand who is talking to who and what they're talking about I would not have used misused James chapter 5, verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Remember what is most important here when you go to the book of James. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. We are not the twelve tribes that are scattered. That is who James is writing to. We are a new creature in the body of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. If you're getting anointed because you believe your pastor and not your Bible, then make sure your pastor has the right oil. It is not olive oil from your local grocery store like they used on my daughter. Shameful workmanship. We get the definition of what oil they used in Exodus 37, 29. In the Old Testament writings, doctrine for Israel. And he made the holy anointing oil and the pure incense of sweet spices 
according to the work of the apothecary. 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 One who practices pharmacy. One who prepares drugs for medicinal uses and keeps them for sale. In England, apothecaries are obliged to prepare medicines according to the formulas prescribed by the College of Physicians and are liable to have their shops visited by the censors of the college who have power to destroy medicines which are not good. In the Middle Ages, an apothecary was the keeper of any shop or warehouse, an officer appointed to take charge of a magazine. The etymology of apothecary is a mid-14th century shopkeeper, especially pharmacist, one who stores compounds and sells medicaments from old French apothecary. The same Latin word produced French boutique, Spanish bodega, German apothecary, cognate compounds produced by concealment, old Persian palace, drugs and herbs being among the chief items of non-perishable items. The meaning narrowed in 17th century to druggist. The Apothecaries Company of London separated from the grocers in 1617. Apothecaries were notorious for the assumed gravity and effect, effic, affectation of knowledge generally put on by the gentlemen of this profession who are commonly as superficial in their learning as their pandetic in their language. So an apothecary is a pharmacist by definition. Not olive oil from Jewel. Isn't it sad? I mean, it is horribly sad. These places that call themselves churches who have no idea what the Bible says about anything. To cause the earth plentiful to yield her increase is also what John Hancock stated. Genesis 1, 11, And God hath said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Genesis 1, 12, And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Genesis 1.24, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and the beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And here is the death knell verse to the ignorant about global warming. You ready? Drum roll. Again, here is the death knell verse to the ignorant about global warming. Have you ever noticed that people who ultimately are not saved. And if you're not saved, you're a child of wrath, Ephesians chapter 2. You are spiritually dead, okay? You are dead in your trespasses and sins. And if you've noticed, the dead, those that are children of wrath, the unsaved, because, you know, there's only two people on the face of the planet. There is the saved and the unsaved, okay? There is not the liberal. There is not the conservatives. There is not the Republican. There is not the Democrat. There is not the non-denominational person, the denominational person. It is the saved and unsaved, okay? And I'm going to say the majority is unsaved. And they will attack every single thing that God has made. God has made the climate. God has made the earth. God has made, God has become flesh and, be, and became Jesus Christ and claimed to be God and they destroy, try to destroy him, right? Anything that God hath said, that marriage is between a male and a female, that there's only two genders, that there's, they will attack it until they're blue. They will elevate humanity and diminish deity. That is what the unsaved do. And as a matter of fact, that is almost what the so-called saved do. The evangelical, 73% of evangelicals claim that Jesus Christ is a created being, not God. And that is sad because 73% who claim to be evangelicals are teaching the public. 
And so they will probably have trouble with global warming too. But in Genesis 8.22, God makes it clear. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. So that means one is not going to be more than the other, unless you are in the tribulation. Unless you are going through the end times. Because then there will be no sun or moon. Clearly that's not today. And a third of the earth will be on fire. And maybe you'll be on that side, and then maybe you'll think it's global warming, right? Then John Hancock goes to say that we are supplied with the necessary, necessaries and the comforts of life to prosper our merchandise and fishery. To prosper our merchandise and fishery. Note what Paul says about how God prospers us when we're not under any covenant. Ephesians 2.12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And by the way, I am using a 1769 King James Bible, perfectly preserved and without error. That is where every verse is coming from in this lesson today. Just in case I did not mention that earlier, I am a King James Bible believer, that of the 1769, not 1611. It is God's perfect word without error. It has absolutely not one error in it. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 And that ye study to be quiet. Now, if God's going to give us everything, okay, and God's going to teach us everything, and God has already predestined us to go to heaven. Okay? Why does he tell us to study, to be quiet, and to do our own business, and to work with our own hands as we commanded you? Because we're not under a covenant. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Oh, there goes welfare. 2 Thessalonians 3.12 Now, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So, do your own business, study to be quiet. 2 Timothy 4, 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Oh, so not pew warming for 30 years? Do the work of an evangelist? Study to show yourself approved unto God? A workman who needeth not to be ashamed? Rightly dividing the word of truth? 2 Timothy 2.15 So much for God prospering us in the comforts of life and merchandise and fishery. We have to work. We have to provide for our own family or we're worse than an infidel if you're providing for harvest translation chapel more than you are than your own family you're worse than an infidel if you're providing everything that you have for willow creek and not your own family you're worse than an infidel And above all, John Hancock says, not only to continue to us in the enjoyment of our civil rights and liberties, but the great and most important blessing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And together with our cordial acknowledgments, I do earnestly recommend that we may join the penitent confession of our sins and implore the further continuance of the divine protection and blessings of heaven upon his people, especially that he would be graciously pleased to direct and prosper the administration of the federal government and of this and the other states in the Union, to afford him further smiles on our agriculture and fisheries, commerce and manufacturers, to prosper our university and all seminaries of learning, to bless the virtuously struggling for the rights of men so that universal happiness may be allies of the United States and to afford his almighty aid to all people who are established in the world, that all may bow to the scepter of our Lord Jesus Christ and the whole earth be filled with his glory. And I do also earnestly recommend to the good people of this commonwealth to abstain from all servile labor and recreation inconsistent with its solemnity of the said day. 
Note, it is unfortunate John doesn't tell us what this gospel is, but he does mix confession with it, so we know it is not the gospel of Christ, the power of God, unto salvation. He tells the people of the commonwealth to confess. Did you pick that up? Let me read it again. And together with our cordial acknowledgement, I do earnestly recommend that we may join the penitent confession of our sins and implore the further continuance of the divine protection and blessings of heaven upon this people. It is unfortunate John doesn't tell us what this gospel is. He says the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Well, what is that? But he does mix confession with it. Or is his gospel including confession? So you know it's not the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation, which is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And as we continue to go through John's proclamation, I'm going to leave you hanging here with a question. Is confession part of the gospel of God's grace? And is confessing your sin going to get you blessings like John has said here? And let me read it one more time. And together with our cordial acknowledgments, I do earnestly recommend that we may join the penitent confession of our sins and implore the further continuance of the divine protection and blessings of heaven upon this people. Will God bless you today if you confess your sins? Email me with your answer at preachingthegospelthatsaves.com from my contact page. Email me any doctrinal questions. If you post them on YouTube, I will not engage in the debate. I have nothing to debate about. What I believe is what I believe. It's according to God's perfectly preserved words. It's according to mid-Acts dispensational Pauline right division of my 1769 King James Bible. I have nothing to debate. If you have any doctrinal questions, email me from my contact page. If you want to post things on my YouTube channel, you will not get a response. And if you have not subscribed to my bookstore blog, please do that from my website at preachingthegospelitsaves.com and subscribe to my YouTube channels. Thanks again.